states that can decide the outcomes of a federal election just purely on its own. And with many regional communities home to coal miners, past, present and future, politicians, parties and candidates, they can't avoid conversations around coal, energy and the environment. We know that climate versus coal and the debate around it had a heavy influence on the outcome of the last federal election. But will it be different this time around? Daniel Wild is Director of Research at the Institute of Public Affairs and they've been calling for bipartisan support for the future of coal mines, worried that if Australia follows through on its commitment to net zero emissions by the year 2050, that regional Queensland will be severely hit. And Daniel Wild is with us this afternoon on ABC Radio. Thank you for joining us. G'day, thanks for having me. You've been in, in uh, regional Queensland this week. What have you been sensing when you're out in the community? Well, we are in uh, regional Queensland. We started off in Cairns and we're working our way down through the community. So we're in Mackay at the moment, then heading down to, uh, to Gladstone. And we're here really to talk to local communities about, as you mentioned, the coal industry and the impact of net zero emissions especially and what that's going to do to, to the coal sector and what our research has demonstrated. And what we're finding out from the community is there's a great deal of concern about the impact that net zero will have. And they feel that they're not being listened to by the cities, you know, by Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne, Canberra elites, that they're being forgotten about. And this is one of the key issues here, which is, and it goes to a, you know, a finding of our research, which is really interesting and important, which is that a policy of net zero emissions means that a worker in a typical regional part of the country is over three times as likely to have their job put at risk by the policy of net zero compared with an inner city worker. And so this gets to the really big divide in our nation in terms of who is net zero going to impact. It's not those in the regions that are advocating for net zero, much less in North Queensland. It's those from the inner cities who are shielded from the impact of that policy. So this is an issue not just of, of jobs, but to the ability of those in regional Australia to have their voice heard in the halls of parliament. Well, there are some in regional Queensland that feel very strongly that we do need to move to net zero. And a lot of people, Daniel Wilde, that are tied up with the Great Barrier Reef and the tourism and, and aspects of that would argue that they would love to see Australia go to net zero emissions by the year 2050. But is your case that you're making to us that that will come at a cost that people may not fully grasp yet? That, yes, if you, if you agree that climate change is an existential threat and we have to follow through on this, what is the cost going to be? And if you actually knew what the cost was going to be, would you still have the same fervour behind your, your, you know, your pro support for it? So put to us the cost of Australia going to net zero emissions in terms of uh, impacts on coal mining regions. Yeah, look, that's a really good way of putting it. And, and there is a significant cost. What our research has identified is that across Australia, you know, it's a question of what does net zero mean, right? What, what does it mean to go to net zero? And this is something that neither, you know, Labor or Coalition want to talk about. What does it mean? At a general level, people might like the sound of net zero, but when we talk about what it means, people begin to understand that there's a real cost. And what we identified is that net zero will result in the cancellation of up to half a million jobs across Australia, with about 125,000 of those jobs being in North Queensland. Now, to put that in context, that's the equivalent to around 25 years' worth of employment growth in the region. Now, the reason why these costs will be imposed is because under net zero, you simply cannot have any new coal, oil or gas projects. If you need to cut emissions, you can't add more emissions. And so this is where we start to get into the issue of the impacts on regional Australia, costing all of those jobs I mentioned. But also, you know, it goes to the, the communities and the society we want to live in because these coal projects provide a lot of revenue to governments, both at the local level and the state level, and that helps fund a lot of the critical so social infrastructure we rely on, whether it's schools, roads or hospitals. So this flows through right through the community and like I say, the cost will be concentrated in parts of parts of Australia like North Queensland. We're hearing from Daniel Wilde with the Institute of Public Affairs. They're on a Queensland tour this week and they're calling for bipartisan support for the future of coal mines in Queensland. You talk about the cost of the jobs loss, but is that not factoring in that there will be other jobs created by renewables and by hydrogen, the hydrogen economy? And as we transition to other fuel sources, simply the jobs will um, be created in those areas and avenues. Mm. Look, it's a good question. Um, there's a couple of points I'd make there. The first is that the claimed you know, jobs benefits from going to net zero are, are fairly speculative and they're out in the future, uh, whereas the costs are in the here and the now. So there's a real disconnect between saying, look, we're going to have all of these benefits and there's going to be this technology will come on stream. But look, maybe it will one day. But the reality is they're talking about the year 2050, whereas we're talking about what is happening in the year 2022. 
what we can also look at is, well, what has happened in the past in terms of the jobs? And what we know is the jobs aren't there. You know, the new green economy isn't supplying the jobs, isn't creating the jobs to offset the jobs that are being lost in traditional industries. And I just want to give you one example. Over the last decade, for every one job that's been created in the renewable sector, five jobs have been lost in the manufacturing sector. And that gives you a bit of an idea of the jobs that are being lost and not being replaced. Um, And one other point to make here, which I think is important and gets lost in the debate a little bit, is the coal mining sector is the highest paid sector of our economy. You know, the average coal worker is paid double what the average worker is across the economy, and about 95% of those jobs are full-time. You know, so this is really the foundation of the community. These full-time, well-paid, stable jobs are not being replaced with equivalent jobs. And that's the real issue. And this is why we need to have a conversation and also to have some truth about what this is going to mean to local communities. Uh, the Greens today are proposing a levy on coal exports. They say that that would actually allow the funding of disaster recovery and the development of the hydrogen sector. If we were to um, you know, see uh, a situation where Australia did continue allowing coal mines to open and operate, would that be a, a model that might actually strike a balance? We just add a levy at the export and that helps to, you know, I guess, counter some of the impact that burning that coal might have on the environment and the, the fallout for Australia? No, the last thing Australia needs is another mining tax that will decimate our industry. And the point is, I, I don't quite share the premise of, I, I guess, the, uh, the premise of the uh, policy that, that's being put by the Greens, which is that essentially coal mines are, are having this significant impact on the climate, or at least coal mines from Australia. Because what we're, what we're told is that you know, climate change and emissions are a global issue. So if it's a global issue, we needed to look at it at the global level. And, you know, shutting down or replacing or shrinking the size of our coal sector does not necessarily mean you're going to have less coal or fewer coal mines on a, on a global basis. You know, if a country isn't going to buy coal from us, say China, they need coal to power their industrial economy. If they're not, if they're not going to get coal from us, they're going to get it from another country. So this is a global issue. And my point is very simply this. If we go down the road of wanting to shut down our coal mines or put a tax on our coal mines to deal with issues relating to emissions, that's not going to make any difference on a global scale or no discernible difference on a global scale. But the impacts here will be real in terms of the costs, in terms of the you know, lost economic output and the lost economic opportunities. So I think that's the issue we need to be discussing. And last uh, election, it was very much a case that, um, that the seats in the coal belt uh, went the way of the coalition. And there was a real feeling that in the climate versus coal um, debate that, that the you know that the media and that the the pollers and everyone hadn't really got it right. They hadn't actually tapped into the right vibe of, of regional Queensland. We're again looking at a debate around climate versus coal. Um, but do you feel like maybe the odds are stacked a little bit more in the in the favour of the climate at the moment? With um, you know so many countries signing on to net zero 2050 and both the major parties committing to reaching that. Well, look, I see where you're coming from, but I have a different perspective. I think the debate has changed a lot over the last few months. So Australia signed up to net zero back in October when there was the Glasgow Climate Conference. But since then, there's been a lot of development. I mean, Russia has invaded Ukraine. There's been the growing instability in the Asia-Pacific region. And I think what a lot of people have realised and what a lot of nations have realised is you need to have your own domestic energy sovereignty and energy security. You know, and the foundation, the foundation of that is to have reliable, you know, baseload power and not to be reliant on other nations for your energy supply, which is what happened to Germany and what happened to Western Europe with regards to Russia. Now, I'm not saying Australia is in the same boat, uh, but policies like net zero are not going to help us. You know, by taking away our sovereignty over our energy resources, that risks undermining our capacity to, you know, be able to build the critical infrastructure that we might need in a, in a more uncertain world. So I think that once those costs, you know, whether it's job costs or national security costs become more apparent, uh, people are less sure, you know, about whether they support net zero. And the other point I would make is, you know, nations that have signed up, for example, the UK, and now backing away from it. You know, Boris Johnson asked for a pause on, uh, on the UK's net zero commitments uh, in relation to the foreign policy situation that the nation was facing. So once again, it's a question of, well, net zero might sound at a, at a marketing level, if you like, as a, as a nice idea. But once we dig beneath the surface of what it means, fewer people support it. Daniel Wild on a Queensland tour at the moment with the Institute of Public Affairs. And thank you for joining us this afternoon from Mackay. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Daniel Wild, Director of Research with the Institute of Public Affairs at 20 minutes past four. The election. It's easy to get lost amongst the... Easy to get lost.